So how, what was the impact of this on your uh, school experience? Um, well, so what happened was, um, I, after about six months, I decided that I was going to um, tell someone um, what was going on because um, he had um, made a way in with my family. Um, so he had um, been over to my my family's house for lunch multiple times. He had um, he was always in church with my family, um, and so he had not just groomed me, but he'd also groomed my parents. Yes, right. And so I. I didn't really know what to do. So I decided that I was going to tell someone, um, not my parents, but I, I did uh, confide in, in a trusted adult. And that person who I confided in me sexually abused me. So that was. Oh, eight. my God. The person that you confided in also sexually abused you. Yes, they didn't. That I'll just, I mean, I'm not naming names or whatever, but I, I, it was in a confessional. So because I was devoutly Catholic, I went to the priest on Holy Thursday before Easter at one of those uh, services where there's hundreds of school kids and, you know, there's priests scattered throughout the whole sanctuary. And I chose one with the door because I didn't want anyone to hear. And I was, um, you know, not believed. I was, I was shamed. I was blamed. Um, I was asked to um, come across, if you know anything about Catholic Church, you know, you sort of sit on a pew and, and speak through um, a screen so the person can't see you. Yes. And um, the priest asked me to come on to the other side where he could actually um, see me to have a conversation to see if he could tell from my facial expressions whether I was telling the truth or not. So not only did he condemn me and tell me things like I was making up stories or I was had a dirty mind or I was going to grow up to be a, a tramp when I was a teenager and that I needed to stop lying. He also insisted that if I was telling the truth that I show him. Oh, brother. What I was, um, yeah. what, oh, was brother. Yeah. what was going on with this other person. Yeah. So uh, um, leaping ahead, I, I have to wonder what is your stance relationship with the Catholic Church at this point in your life? Oh, that's a that's a whole other story. It's been very, um, you know, it's it's hard to. I, I'm there's a man who's very involved here in Canada, John Swales. I don't know if you know much about him in um, the states, but he's a, a bit big advocate um, right here in Ontario, and so he's been uh, very supportive of helping me because of his similar situation. Um, nonetheless, um, it's it's really been hard because I feel like um, I I feel you know violated and and used and abused, and yet yeah. by the same token I felt like if I left the church that that I was giving up on God and that that was somehow um you know that I couldn't do that and so I I did sort of I, I had my chill I got I I, ended, I got married in that church I had my children baptized in that church um I I stuck to the status quo of my family um and then when I was in my 20s, I left and I went and joined some, someplace else. And then I ended up completely giving up on it altogether and becoming more of an agnostic. And now I'm sort of finding my way back to faith because I think that mm -hmm. you know, spirituality is a really core, important part of of balance right of mind, body, spirit. It doesn't have to be, be God. It can just be like your sense of purpose. Yeah. Or meaning in life. Um, so I, I'm, I try to stay focused more on the heart of the Gospels and not so much the clericalism and the religious doctrine. Yes. Um, but it's been, when this happened to me, I didn't know, of course, that any, that any other children in the world were going through this. Right. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's so many cases, and it's, it's been a big problem uh, in the church. And it's the secrecy, right? Like nobody's yeah. nobody's talking about it, and so and then when people finally did start talking about it, it was mostly boys. And I thought, well, this I'm an isolated incident because I'm I'm a girl, and so um, really, it's only been in the last couple years that I've been able to get my head around the fact that it doesn't really matter what my gender or is; it's a predatory behavior. Yeah, um, yeah. So. 
Wow, what a journey, I must say. Uh, that's a lot to uh, to have to overcome and to integrate and so on. And uh, and I imagine that somewhere along the line, you must have uh, sought out one or more kinds of therapy. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I ended up getting, uh, I went to, I mean, when I, I don't really have any mem. so this happened when I was in grade five, and I have hardly any memories of grade six, seven, eight, very, just fragments here and there, like graduation or a, a, a dance or a carnival, but but very, very distant and vague. Um, and throughout my adolescence, I had a lot of issues with like depersonalization and derealization, like, you know, um, looking in the mirror and, and then looking back into my bed to see if I was still there, not really feeling like I belonged. Wow or almost like I was standing outside of myself, like looking through, I don't know, I would use the example of like a frosted glass window where I was there, but I wasn't in, in inside. Yes. Um, and so this started in my adolescence and um, I was in an abusive relationship as, in a, as a teenager and, you know, re-victimization is common, unfortunately. Um, and so um, that again, those same pr symptoms that I had as a child began to present themselves again at 16 with the, wow. with the DI issues. Only now I was having full blown panic attacks and, um, and I had stopped eating. So an electrolyte imbalance sent me to hospital. And that was the first time that I got therapy was at 16. Um, uh -huh. was, so yeah. it's, it's almost as if the, the, the predatory, usually males, the predatory males somehow pick up on the vulnerability, the already existing vulnerability from earlier incidents. That is, it's as if there were a, an odor or something that they could sense and pick up on. I, I, I thank behavior, you so You know, of a, of a child who's been uh, pre-sexualized, if you will. I, I thank you for saying that because I, I think when you ask questions about re-victimization, a lot of people will put it back on the victim that they have low self-esteem, that they have low self-worth, and, and we do, <laughs> but yeah. that it, it's far bigger than that. I think it's more to do with, you know, putting it back where it belongs, which is with the predator and the predatory instinct of, of people to be able to, you know, target specific people that they know are going to are shy vulnerable withdrawn um that are that are easy targets um mm -hmm. and also i think my hypervigilance even though i wasn't diagnosed with ptsd in my teens i think hypervigilance prevent sometimes can lead to revictimization because with hypervigilance i'm i'm looking for a danger that no longer exists so i don't see the danger that's right in front of me uh. you know i don't you know when i'm I'm not sure if that makes sense. Well, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And, and there is a way in which it's kind of hard to wrap one's head around that, I think. Uh, well, I, I guess I could understand it from the point of view of, of maybe a massive internal fear mm -hmm. that that is so frightening that it blinds you to seeing it because you don't want to see it because it's too scary to admit. I, I, absolutely, absolutely, and your your fight or flight response. It's it's hard to differentiate between a red flag and butterflies in your stomach because it all feels the same. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's you know it's 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 a complicated disorder, definitely.